Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat podcast. Today is Saturday. I hope you're ready for a fantastic day out there. It is March 2nd. We have had an absolutely fun week this week. We are ready for another crazy week out there. I'll tell you what, with as many regulations are out there, as many different things are going on, you're going to see many people around the world gaining uh, traction and kind of going, wait a minute, we don't like these regulatory actions. And you're going to see some uh, backlash from the folks that are actually in charge, creating even more regulatory actions. So buckle up, sit back and enjoy the rest of the weekly summary that we have for you. The staff has picked the best producing stories and we're going to have a great weekend. We will, Michael and I will see you Monday morning. Thanks. Let's start out with net zeros. Days are numbered. I could only hope uh, there's no way we're going to get there, Michael. And uh, this one is going to be kind of tough. The public does not believe or has not been made to understand that it's going to be costly for them. Blanchard Blanchard is Oliver Blanchard is pouring water on the claim on the house of Lords in the UK. He's the uh, former IMF chief economist. If you don't know what the IMF is, it's imagine the fed, but for like the entire globe. So they oh, have an yeah. incentive to, keep it locked up and tight and for for someone like this to be saying this it's i mean he's the former so he's not right. currently there but still but still he says the financial fiscal cost to achieve anything close to net zero um it, it's he's He's dead on right. There's no way that we can fiscally get there. Uh, the wind is, this is a quote, the wind industry is admitting the ability to generate wind power has been vastly, Michael, wait for it, overestimated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the bursting of the wind really? bubble. Yeah, the industry's messaging has switched to crude blackmail. Um RWE's German boss, uh, Mark Kreber, told the Financial Times, it is, of course, concerning because the UK's climate targets cannot be achieved without offshore wind. <laughs> they can't make it anyway. I mean, no. the offshore wind, we've seen an absolute bust. People are bailing out like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, projects are getting canceled left and right. I mean... <laughs> The closest thing we're going to get to 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 the IMF saying this is the former chief guy over there, because trust me, they've got an incentive over there to make sure this net zero stuff hits. So I always like to look at that. Um, you know, this was basically um, there, there was also this interesting German owned electrical producer, RWE. They briefed the Financial Times that the level of government support funded through the guaranteed prices um, electricity are forced to pay for wind energy. So they're forced to pay for it now, even if it costs more. I, I found this also very interesting. The last uh, paragraph in here, Michael, says the purpose of writing net zero into law is the anti-democratic one of putting net zero beyond politics. So that I thought was very admirable of him to admit that once these things are put in there, it's they're trying to appease their base. Mm -hmm. in either the UK or the US. Uh, just because you're trying to appease the base doesn't mean it's right. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> hey, let's go to research warns net zero policies risk plunging thousands into poverty. Ugh. I'd even I didn't even touch that uh, and put that. I'd even put more on there. Millions will die. <laughs> <laughs> I would if you just see something like millions will die. You know that would be me. But new research has been published by the Institute in Community Studies. Uh, I went to the website and you have to mm -hmm. go through. It says, oh, here's where the study is, but you got to buy it. So this article is pretty interesting. Um, local councils and central governments were not trusted to lead sustainable changes. So members of public had no choice but take matters into their own hands. Whenever we start mentioning the public or the leaders taking put things into their own hand, I get nervous, dude. 
Uh, here's a quote from Emily Morrison, director of sustainability from the young, uh, young foundation said our research shows there is a will an appetite and even urgency amongst the public, including the most vulnerable, uh, and poorest households to participate in the transition to net zero. It has to be done through climate policy. Yeah. That's an easy way to drive people to their grave. It is. It's just, I want to be the place where people can come and talk about openness of talking about physics and reality. Yeah. I, physics and fiscal reality matter. And <laughs> anyway, millions upon millions will die. If I was Carl Sagan, I'd say billions upon billions will be dead. Yeah. So. I mean, it, the, the problem is when you're, to bring somebody out of poverty, you have to provide them with an extremely affordable option that's also extremely efficient. It's not just, yes, in, in, in a perfect world, I'd love my car to have zero emissions. But guess what? The most efficient and cost-effective option has a trade-off of some small amount of emissions. And, you know, Thomas Sowell said it best. There are no good options. There are only trade-offs. So what are we willing to give on one side to give the other? Are, are we willing to basically keep the poor poor in order to make the environment, you know, marginally better? Or do we want to raise everybody out of poverty and have a slightly worse off environment margin on the margins? Well, I'll tell you what I take all day, every day as, as the great, and, as the great and wondrous, um, uh, oh, I know that, um, uh, both things can be true. And uh, and both of these things can be true. You can have your that's, low that's cost. Uh, Tisha Schuler. Thank over you. At Adam I, I had a brain cramp. Would love You're me good. some Tisha. And both of these things can be true if it is worked out in both sides. You can have your ecologically good energy and your your low cost. It has to be worked together. No, absolutely, it it definitely can. Um, but there is. It, but we also live in a world of 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 trade offs, and so I think that's what we have to we have to look here. And you know, we, yep. we may get you need to rewrite the title. Let's go over to Saudi Arabia. Can uh, Saudi Arabia can no longer raise oil output for cash? This one I stole from Irina Slav. It's kind of like we had an old folks day here hanging around. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been spending heavily both abroad and at home. But as she points out, also they're they are spending a trillion dollars in mm. in clean energy, supposedly, which uh -huh. you, you and I both know that's kind of a misnomer. Yeah. Um, but the sovereign wealth fund has now got some issues. And mm. there's a quote in here that you gotta really uh like and says, uh, don't let a good crisis go to waste. We all know what that one is. Yep. There's going to be a pricing thing that she talks about in here. Um, these plans would really need big money if they stand a chance to ma ma materialize and the kingdom is ready to go to great lengths to make all of their plans. Mm -hmm. now, they're basically saying they've got the reserves. They're not putting in the CapEx uh, in order to pull those reserves out. And there's about 16 other articles I've been reading all over the, the place of a massive amount of um, just general dollars that are needed uh, in order just to meet decline curves. At one time, it was $4 trillion. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty funny that Saudi Aramco, the world's largest oil corporation, says that, they at these prices can't drill. And what does that tell you about American projects? What does it tell you about the CapEx that's being spent in America right now? And not to be a Debbie Downer, but if you can't find profitable projects in Iran in Saudi Arabia to drill, I mean, what are, what are we doing well, here? See, there, there's a little bit of difference. If I was if I was holding back, and maybe I didn't explain it quite as well. But if I was sitting there looking at Saudi Aramco, you got a heck of a uh, reserve sitting there. Why do you, a known reserve? There is no wildcatting when you walk out to the, mm -hmm. the desert and go, I need me some oil and get a spoon and dig it up. There's no wildcatting going on. So why would you even wait and have extra production come online until the price goes up? So... 
now they have got themselves in a bind with lower prices because they took the high road with OPEC and cut theirs uh, as the primary uh, cuts going on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, all right. Wasn't that fun? No, it's, it, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm sitting here just reading this article. It, it, it you know, what it's always seems like the CFO. That's where these quotes are coming from. It's always seems like the CFO is the Debbie downer because last week it, I love the article. Aramco issued a grim warning about the state of global oil production capacity. Of course, that's coming from the finance guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But he's his office is right next to the IR guy. Now, yeah. um, so <laughs> he could be the CFO of the week, man. <laughs> what he do you could. think? He could. U.S. electrical generation by source in 2023. Natural gas, coal, nuclear, wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, biomass, and petroleum. Okay. This is by Wolf Richer for the Wall Street. Um, uh, I thought this was great. It used a lot of the EIA data, but it also really kind of put it together in a way that it was generated by source. And so when you take a look at the mix, share of renewable wind, solar, geothermal, biomass was 22%. Share of renewables without hydro was 16.5. So you sit back and take a look. Hydro's a big chunk. It is. Love me some hydro. Um, but when you take a look at coal, uh, and Miss Producer, if you could fly in the second chart, or yeah, the second chart, which is in the middle of the article. Electrical titled, generated by source gigawatts per hour. It's got coal, nat gas, nuclear, renewables, petroleum for everybody listening. Right. One thing that's clear since 2001 or really since 2008, coal has been on a slight tumble down, but, it's seen, <laughs> but it's seen a comeback. What's it crazy is. is it's seen a comeback in 2020. Uh, and uh, we had a dip back, but the world is going coal. King Cole ain't dead yet. Mm -hmm. So um, now uh, when you take a look, I thought that the next chart down, Michael, gigawatt hours by wind and then uh, hydro, all solar. Yeah, solar so this is wind. just showing this is just showing the renewable sources, wind, hydro, solar and then biomass. Right. The thing that I saw this was geothermal biomass and hydro were very closer to the uh, nuclear flat lines. I mean, they, they're a heck of a lot more uh, stable, and I sure like them. Well, and well, stable is in they're just not growing because it's really hard. Geothermal, we haven't had much activity happening, so I wouldn't expect geothermal electrical generation to grow year over year. Hydro is tough because you, we're I'm going to I'm going to disagree with the almighty one. Um, we are seeing some technology breakthroughs in geothermal. I'm I get that, but it's not showing up in the data because it's flat. Oh, no, not remember, yet. These are but electrical. I, you this said is the amount won't. of gigawatts no. hours generated. Yeah. By Michael, sports. you said we won't see any. And I'm saying, yes, we will. Technology's coming around the corner. You said right. we well, won't. In this in this data set, we're not seeing any growth in that. I get why hydro is not growing. It's a little, at some point, oh, you just, uh, yeah. you, at some point, you're limited by how much stuff. So, yes, geothermal, we know there's some stuff going on. Stu's talked at nauseum about that, but really interesting research uh, by Wolf Street here. <laughs> at nauseum. I love it. Um, but what, what gets me is the cost per kilowatt hour is not in this article. I just thought it was great to talk about actually the sources. This is on Energy News. We got Average oh. cost of energy, of course. Goldman CEO uh, sees more uncertainty to soft landing expectations. Will this impact global oil demand? You can see that I added that last sentence because uh, I knew you were thinking that. But here's the thing with Goldman Sachs, he says, we're the world is set up for a soft uh, landing, said Solomon. Uh, the market certainty perceives there's a very, very high delta to a soft landing. Mm -hmm. My own view is that it's a little bit more uncertain than that. I got to give him hand, uh, credit for at least admitting that it's uncertain yep. rather than, um, is it Yeltsin, Yelton, whenever she's always saying, oh, it's transitory. Well, I, I find it hilarious that he's like, we're set up for a soft landing, but I'm this, but as the CEO of one of the, the largest organizations that studies 
financial information, I'm uncertain about it. <laughs> Who's uncertain about it? That... Your analysts, your an- so so your analysts are saying one thing, and you think, well, do you trust your own analysts, or are you getting different data than what they're putting out? You see where I'm reading into this. You you can read what a CEO says just by that comment. Yeah, no, absolutely. It 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 is. A I read this and I was comment. like, wait a second. So you're getting you're getting side data from your analyst team, but you're you know we're set up for a soft landing. That's what you know. That's what the analysts are saying, but oh, I don't yeah. think so. Well, well, oh, no. why? And and I think it's because of the global printed money, and uh, it's sitting here. It's kind of funny. Even the NGOs are now mm-hmm. all the money's dried up for the social programs and stuff. It's not just energy that's running out of money. It's everybody is running out yeah. of money. No, absolutely. It's it's unbelievable. Let's go to the next one here. Home builders are fighting green building. Homeowners will pay. This one is really getting, and it affects a lot. It is in the energy space as they are trying to force everyone to have high energy um, uh, uh, methodology in building their houses and making them more efficient, smaller, uh, that make new houses more efficient and compatible with clean technology. That is more expensive, and we're pushing the prices of houses outside of the average person now with this. Uh, Let's go through some of it. And the EIA, the, uh, uh, the unbelievable, the energy um, uh, group there, housing climate impact um, is uh, carbon emissions in 2022 residential was a uh, big part of it. I believe it was 19%. And so when you sit back and go, what was in this 19% um, is you can't just lump residential in there. Is that the building? Is that uh, driving to and from work? Um, I'm not sure that I really uh, think that this is fair, the cost argument that the home builders is, is saying is deeply flawed in two ways. A uh, $20,000 figure for increasing on each home uh, was only from one survey. It appears to be a wild exaggeration. A federal study found the new standards would actually raise building expenses by 4700 to 6500 for a single family home. Uh, lowering energy bills means homeowner would recoup their upfront cost in just a few years. This one I highly disagree with because it never works that way. And if we had a balanced plan to get from energy, um, uh, fossil fuels, and you want to go to net zero in a least a cost, cost effective way, um, it would not matter. And people would be able to afford this, which came first. Uh, the house that had a lot of uh, insulation or having any money just to have a roof over your head. And uh, this is not going to pan out very well for them at all. In fact, uh, Miss Producer, if you could bring up the video, I have a video uh, that uh, that some of the folks in the energy department sent over. <laughs> and he's he's swinging, and boom! And uh, so when you sit back and kind of, that's a normal meeting in the energy department trying to make up regulatory actions. So uh, thank you, Ms. Producer. I appreciate that.